All right, welcome to this week's fantastic invertebrate paleontology topic, where we are going to look at bryozoans, one of the happiest fossils ever. That's what I'm supposed to have drawn. So what are bryozoans? Bryozoans are a colonial animal. They're still around today, although the, the ancient ones looked a little different as we'll get to, but it's a colonial animal, a filter feed, and in many ways that they often resemble corals on the seabed. Um, in fact, that many ancient ones were mistaken for corals. The name means moss animal, but here's the cool thing. Bryozoans may superficially look like corals, but they've got that crazy lophophore. And if you've already watched the video on brachiopods, you've learned about a lophophore. Bryozoans have a lophophore. So even though they superficially look like corals, they're actually related to brachiopods. So let's get into bryozoans. I think I'll have to get rid of the little cartoon guy. All right, so bryozoans. They're colonial filter feeders. They've got that cool lophophore. I think I want to say is that when you're looking at rocks in the Paleozoic, they can be super common in shallow marine systems, really diverse. Uh, so we can do a lot with them. And you can still find them today uh, walking on beaches and, and in the marine environment. Uh, they're different forms, but they're still around today. Now, when I've if you've watched some of these other videos, I've tried to distinguish between how important it is these days to use cladistics and to use either hopefully like genetics, if you've got uh, modern representatives, or at least a very careful look at characters and the statistical method to try to group them using parsimony. That was a lot of words out of the mouth. What that means is that instead of just guessing things look their things are related to each other because the way they look, you actually break them down to their parts. And then use use math to say, well, the simplest model, parsimony, the simplest model of saying who's related to who is, is how to have them shared parts without trying to do a bunch of crazy runarounds to explain why they're together. For instance, even though bryozoans look nothing like brachiopods on their shell, the fact they have that loaf of four, it's such a crazy, weird organ. Nothing else has it, so they have to be together. Now, the reason I bring this up at the beginning about bryozoans is before I go into the groups, I want to say that um, they've been a real challenge. Even though they're well-preserved, they've been a real challenge to break apart in the fossil record as to who's related to who, kind of wiping out a lot of the earlier Linnaean system groupings uh, because it, it's because there's so much similarity and so much convergent evolution within the group. So I'm making this video today. It may not be so valid in a year or two. Certainly the bryzoan groups that exist today are not the same ones I learned when I was in paleontology. So guess what? That's science. And we dig that. We like the fact that that science changes things with new information. Now, with that said, let's get into kind of the general uh, shapes and fossil record of bryozoans. All right, we'll get this party started with uh, the taxonomy. And this is, again, it's going to change. This is the, um, the latest that I've seen looking at the paleobiology database, which for better or for worse, that's what I use as my um, standard for knowledge here. And so the bryozoans can be broken down into three classes. Now, the first one I listed there, the the um, uh, Phylactolemata, 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 could be in a musical. Um, these are the bryozoans that live in non-marine conditions, freshwater. Um, and then the colonies are kind of like gelatinous. They don't have a lot of hard parts and, um, or sometimes they're tubular. They have a pretty fossil record. I said that bad word. I hope it gets edited out. Uh, they, um, that they, but they go back probably to the Cretaceous and they're still around today. So those are the Flactolomatas. We don't look at those in class. In class, what I really focus on are the Stenolomata or Stenolomates and the Gymnolomates. And although there are examples of Stenolomata that still are around today, I really think about this group as dominating the Paleozoic. That's where you. That's where you. That's like the most common fossils you find as a geologist, and the gymnolomata are what I think of as if, again they go back to the Ordovician, but they're really what you're finding in in modern in in the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, and so how do you tell the Stenolomata separate from the Genolomata? Well, in order to do that, 
let's get into some basic biology taught by a geologist. Alrighty, so what I've drawn here is kind of a zooming in on a part of the hard uh, exoskeleton, or the hard skeleton, which is called the zoecium. I'll come back to that. And here's like one guy who's like, you touch it. And it goes inside. You would not do that because we're kind to animals on this little YouTube show. But then here's a living one. No, they're both living. But here's one that's, that's sticking. It's sticking out. So basically it's an eating bag, right? And so it's got that beautiful lophophor, that grabbing, eating, breathing organ. So right in the middle of it is a mouth. It's got a gut and it's got an anus. It can live. And tucked in there are gonads for making babies, that kind of stuff. So it's a pretty simple design. Um, and there's just lots and lots of them because, again, they're colonial. Now, in terms of some of the terminology on this, we, we, we call that individual critter the zoid or as I call it, the lophophore bearing gut bag. And they, they're, they're small, they're like a, a, about a half of a millimeter long. And the zoids are cylindrical and they have those tentacles at the top. So it kind of looks like a jellyfish, but it has that extra little exit hole that jellyfish don't have. Now, the zoid itself is composed of the outer bag, which is called the cystid, and that's what produces the skeleton. And then inside is the polypide, which has all the internal guts, you know, and, and organs and all that, and, and the lophophore. And as a colony, here's what's really cool about, uh, uh, well, there's a lot of things that's cool about bryozoans, one of my favorites, is that the individuals do different tasks. So even though it's this colonial uh, sort of um, a clonal group, there are, there are um, autozoids. So the autozoids who do the feeding and pooping, and then there's these heterozoids, and these get all kinds of names and you get into it. There's Kinozoids, spinozoids, gonozoids, nanozoids, they do all kinds of stuff. Some build skeleton, some defend the colony, some are hatching eggs. They just do all kinds of stuff. But what's really cool is inside that skeleton, and that's what I, I didn't show it, is there's a channel in the structure that allows the critters to like pass nutrients to each other so that the eating ones can feed the ones who are making babies, the ones who are defending. Cool. Okay, let's turn this thing into a fossil. Okay, so here I've drawn the a very basic bryozoan. And so that whole shell, that whole fossil that's preserved, that's called the zoarium. And the holes, when you look at it, the little the holes where the little critters lived, uh, the zoids when they were alive, well, the hole is called a zoecium, or if there's many, zoecia. And um, sometimes, and I can't, it's, it's, I can't zoom in enough on here, but if you look at some of the bryozoans with a hand lens, you might see smaller holes between the bigger holes. Those are called the acanthopores. And it, particularly in, in a group called the cystoparietids, they, um, they might have a lid that can close the, the hole called an aperture. And sometimes that's preserved. Now, the holes where the critters lived, where the zoids lived, the zoecium, don't get those mixed up with, with real holes that go all the way through the skeleton. They're holes, and so we use the Latin term fenestrae. A lot of bryozoans have these holes all the way through the zoarium. They're fenestrae, but they're not the holes that the zoids lived in. Those are the zoecia. So, and, and I've seen a lot of times in these fossils, they're worn out, so they're hard to see these little holes. You just have to keep looking for, for a good... A, a, a preserved surface to see that. So I tried to draw squiggly blue water lines to show you that in some of these holes, you'd be able to look through. Now in a fossil, what that probably means is you're seeing rock, but in other holes, that's where the critters lived. So don't miss up the fenestrae with the zoecia. There you go. Okay, so that's kind of the general thing, but what really makes the bryozoans unique is their different forms. And I said at the beginning, the systematics is challenging because there's a lot of convergent evolution, but um, there, there's some uh, things that we can tell um, to at least tell, tell these uh, uh, bryozoans apart. All right, I've tried to draw at least the major ways you find uh, bryozoans in the rock record. They're not necessarily related to any specific group, but we'll find that they are kind of a little bit. So in this first box here, some of them are free living on the seabed, and we would call that like a discoid form. Sort of a good example of kind of a flat discoid one. Or 
Here's a smaller discoid little guy. Okay, so that's the free living form. Uh, then we talk about these forms that are erect because they're sticking up into the water column and they like, like they, because uh, they're filter feeders. Um, these ones here, these uh, kind of like massive branching structures, super common in my world where, where I look a lot in the Devonian as well as the Silurian. In fact, there's some places where as you're looking on the ground, you find loads of these uh, um, just weathering out of the rocks, like in this video here from, from Morocco. But when you look at them up close, here's an, a good example of kind of a broken, one of those uh, 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 solid erect ones. This one looks a little different because it's got a, it's a different genus, perfect little triangles. I can keep going because I have got loads of Devonian ones all over here. Here's some more, a couple more. In fact, I have one right here. An even different one, kind of cute. Okay, I, I, I'll keep. I'll go. So anyway, so those are. So we would refer to that as as like a massive erect form. Other ones are the frondos forms. Uh, they're they're. You have to kind of get them preserved in the rock in order to see them. And then this last one here, these are what I would call like true branching ones. And I can't draw it that well. But what I was trying to show was one of these fenestrate ones, the ones that have the holes in the skeletons. You can look through the skeleton. Um, and they they would have this amazing structure. Um, this is the only one I have here. It's, it looks kind of knobby, but um, if you look at it up close, this is a an interesting bryozoan because the typically this is a pretty common one in the Carboniferous. It's so common I should have one right here, and I do. <laughs> So you often find these as these Archimedes as these little screws, different sizes. Well, this is actually one of those fenestrate ones, the ones that have the holes in them. The problem is, is that as it gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the holes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so when it gets knocked over, it dies, it's on the seabed and it'll just break apart. And so you often only find the fossil, just the middle of it and not the full form. Believe it or not, this is the same fossil. It's just in this one, it's preserved because it just got preserved better. All of that big fenestrate ones. Here's another example. And so what you're seeing here, can't tell if it's in the, see this, imagine these little guys here. My giant finger. There we go. There we go. You can see the fossil is in the middle. There we go. There it is. And then those arms that are never preserved got preserved in this rock because it's mud. In fact, all over, if I flip it over, look at the, some really nice ones there. We can see the whole fenestrate zone of the bry zone. Anyways, that's this one here. And I just call those branching because I don't have a better word. The last two, and what I tried to show here is like the inside of a shell you might find on a beach, particularly in the modern. And some bryozoans aren't living erect into the water column, but they're attached and they grow on a surface. And so we could simply say that they're they're like a, a mat form or some kind of an encrusting form. For me personally, I, I this is to me is how I often find these gymnolimates. And these are how I find the stenolimates. But let's break that down in a little more detail. All right, let's start with the mostly Paleozoic. Again, they're still around, but I think about them as Paleozoic uh, stenolimates, so the stenolimata. Here's the best I can do for taxonomy on the latest paleo database. We have the cryptostomata, the cyclostomata, the cystoporata, the fenestrata, the rhabdomycida, and the trepostomata. Now, how do you tell these apart? It's tricky. It's using a hand lens. It's looking a lot at the um, shape of the individual zoids, or well, the zoids are gone, but but the actual uh, uh, zoesia where the zoid lived, and also on their their overall shape, and sometimes even just the age of the geology can help you. Um, when I think about the uh, um, the cryptostomata, I often think of the cryptostomata kind of like the fenestrata here. These are the ones that have these um, many branching stolons, those branches, 
separated by the holes, the fenestrate. So the cryptostomes and the fenestrata have those fenestrate. Uh, it includes like the Archimedes that I that I've already showed you here, as well as um, well, sorry. Uh, um, and and since we're also including fenestrata, uh, fenestrella, a common a common one that you might find. Uh, the cyclostomata. I don't know much about those, so we're going to skip those because they're just not ones that I'm used to seeing, and you could probably Google it as well as I could Google it. That's just me being honest to you about that. Uh, the cystoporata, so that cystoporid um, has to do with, it has a, a, a pretty, they're erect ones, they tend to be, brand, they, they come up, but they have a little tiny difference in um in where the zoesia are they have these things called cystoframs that that go between the holes and so the holes are a little different and some common um uh, genera in the cystoporata are like constellaria fistulapora and prismapora prismapora is a really cool one it's um let's see oh i've got one here yeah it's got this kind of triangular looking shape to it Okay, let's see. What else did I do? So, do, 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 we did, uh, I can't even pronounce that one. Let's get to the Treptostomata because they're my favorites. Again, these guys kind of dominate the, the Devonian to me. These are what you find all over the ground when you look. And um, all different kinds. They could be discoid. That's not discoid. That's our discoid. Uh, but they could be um, kind of like, like, Big sticky things here. There's another one. Boop, boop, boop. And even like even relatively big ones, loads of them, uh, trepostome. And uh, we 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 sort of break them out mostly by their by their shapes. And so even though again it's a little tricky with doing the taxonomy, it tends to work pretty good. And uh, one of the common ones, at least where I live, or at least working out in Nevada, is amphipora, which, which can make these really dense blocks, like whole banks of, of amphipora. Pretty cool little guy. All right, let's finish up with the gymnolimates. Two major orders, the stenostomata. These guys don't calcify. They don't have that good of a fossil record. But the chelostomata have a great fossil record. And it's what you find on the beaches today if you're walking around, typically. I guess I don't know everybody's beach, but the beaches I've been to, uh, you find them uh, like here, encrusting, not the worm things. Those are something else. But but if you look closely, you can see these beautiful, uh, yeah, there you are, these encrusting forms. Um, how to tell them apart, they actually, their zoesia are box-like versus the round ones that are more typical of the other bryozoans. The other thing I like about the chelostomata is that when you look at them under a scanning electron microscope, you see just amazing structures. They're really gorgeous. So there you go for bryozoans. So getting back to kind of the key things about bryozoans is that they are um, really common from the Ordovician onward um, and limestone, even siltstones. In the Paleozoic, I think, in my view, bryozoans are typically these erect ones or nodular, you know, uh, discoid things. Although you can find some encrusting brachiopod shells and other surfaces. When you get into the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, in my experience, you find more of the encrusting bryozoans. And of course, you get into kind of the chelostomata. And the erect ones are really common um, in the Devonian and the Silurian. Frond ones, I tend to think about those as being like, like the Fenestelids. Uh, think about those as like Carboniferous Permian. And um, what else? Uh, I think that's about it. So I hope you enjoyed it. Now go out there and find yourself a nice little Bryzoan.